Well, good morning. Actually, more people here than I was expecting. I was thinking March break, we would be fewer in numbers, but I am so glad that you are here. If you're joining us from home as well, I'm glad you've been able to join us through YouTube. Um, not the March break beginning that I was looking forward to. I was thinking, you know, 25 degrees would be quite nice by now, but that's okay. I'm all right with that. You know, we get what we get and, and I'm perfectly okay with that. Uh, a few announcements that I have to make. You know what, I enjoy these now. I, I'm really glad that these are happening in the bulletin. The fun fact. Now, I'm not gonna focus so much on the library. Is Penny here? I don't see Penny. She's at the back. She is, okay. Oh, hi, Penny. She's standing. <laughs> <laughs> she's I'm sorry. The wall, yeah. big, big arms, big arms. <laughs> Penny's at the back, of course. Uh, I'm not gonna focus so much on the library as much as I am on George and Nettie Friesen. How many of you remember George and Nettie Friesen? I was just saying to the gang up here while we were doing practice, I said, you know, it's kind of funny, and I, and I do miss George and Nettie, and we will see them again. Uh, they were a huge part of this congregation uh, many years ago, and, uh, and there's a few of these songs, and one we'll be singing today. George would stand off to the side, no microphone. You would hear him over the worship team. <laughs> he had a voice that commanded... Uh, your time to enter into a time of worship. You had no choice. You wanted to be in a time of worship when you heard that booming voice. Not saying that it was George's doing. God gave him a wonderful gift and he used it. Um, as well as Nettie in the library. And I have to share a funny story simply because Abe and Judy are here this morning. Ha. Uh, it was Nettie's birthday. This is, we were quite a bit younger. And the four of us decided we were going to go sing happy birthday to Nettie. She was working in the library. It was after the service. When we all walked up, we all just started singing, all of us in different keys, <laughs> totally by accident. And it was absolutely, she, she loved it. She absolutely loved it. It sounded <laughs> terrible, and it was amazing. Um, so if you don't know who George and Nettie are, their picture, of course, is in the library. Um, but Tom, keep coming up with these little fun facts for the Bolton. I absolutely enjoy them. Uh, small groups update, there's been some interest from many wanting to uh, get engaged with a small group. Uh, so if you are one of those, talk to Eddie. He'll put you in touch with um, a small group perhaps is looking for some people or starting a new small group. Um, he can definitely help you with that. Um, help also is needed for Peter and Dorothy looking for a place to stay uh, for a short time. Uh, the details there, of course, are in the bulletin as well. Uh, David, where's David? Come on up. I should have had you come up actually right away. So, uh, but this sounds like this may have been a good time yesterday, and I want you to share with what happened. Hello. Um, so yesterday was the community game day. Went really well. Um, we had a great event with <clears throat> lots of fun, and uh, we had about 40 people come through, which was pretty cool. Um, and when we started this project, we had about 50 Bibles in mind uh, with the expectation that we could give enough to our current youth group as well as prepare for growth that we feel God is going to do in our uh, church community. And um, we received lots of cash and food donations um, from attendants as well as people who didn't attend. Um, and we raised $1,085. which is what we need to comfortably afford the 50 Bibles uh, we had in mind. So praise God for that, and we'll keep you posted on the next one. <laughs> hey, David, David, can you oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. So the most important part, that's pretty great, but we have food that needs to go, uh, fruit and veggies and other things that after the service we'll set out and just take it home if you want it, and if you want to leave extra donations, that would be appreciated as well. So, did I forget anything else? <laughs> okay. Perfect, thanks David. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that we have been a blessed community here. Lord, that you have granted us freedom we live in a country where we are not oppressed, where we can shout out to the top of our lungs that you are Lord without fear of persecution. And yet there are those who are around the world right now that are fighting 
quietly. They are yelling out that you are Lord in closets and in their rooms. Lord, I ask that you would bless these people. I have no idea what that must be like. I don't know if there's anyone here that would have ever experienced that, but Lord, I, I know that it is happening. I know that there are those persecuted around the world because of you. And Lord, I ask that you would grant peace, that you would, that you would bring peace to our hurting world, our hurting society. So much is going on that we can see in the papers, we can read online, um, that I'm sure must bring pain to you. Lord, I, I ask that you would be present here this morning, that you would cause your face to smile upon this, this group of believers around this, uh, and in this community as well. As I know there are many, many churches here in Elmer that are gathering right now. And even more so, Lord, that you would cause those to go out and to find the harvest because the workers are few and the harvest is great. So, Lord, as we go into a time of worship, I ask that you would be blessed that we would sing sweet praises and it would be lovely to your ears. And I pray this in your holy name. Amen. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. Able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Able to aid those who are tempted. Able to save the uttermost, those who, who come to God through him, since he always lives and makes intercession for them. Able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Let's stand.
seated. Who here among this crowd, this group of people, who of you are perfect? Put your hand up. I'm not putting my hand up either. I've been thinking of this a lot. How many times have we made mistakes and go, whoa, wow, I screwed up? Yeah, I know. And how many times do we ask God for forgiveness and then ask, why are you still forgiving me? I've done this so many times. I know. I've done that as well. Isn't it amazing that we have a Lord, a God, our Savior, whom we can come to, that we can ask, that we can beg for? Actually, it's funny because we don't have to beg. He's provided his way for us, his path directly to God. And we can come to him openly and we can pray. We can give him our petitions, our thanksgiving. And that's what we're going to do. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we can come before you. In our bulletin, we have prayer requests, but it's so much more than just requests. Lord, I know there are some in this list of names who are desperately seeking healing. There are those seeking, seeking jobs and Lord, we have a, a search committee who is seeking a new pastor. And we have those who are seeking relief from pain, relief from seizures. We have those around our world who are seeking relief from war, struggling with eating disorders. Lord, there are, we think of Norma who is in long-term care, seeking your peace. And Dorothy and Jim and Sandra, as they are halfway around the world, seeking your guidance. Lord, we've been granted freedom to send those around the world. I know leading a reading earlier this week on some of the comments on a blog that I was quite interested in, and some of the comments were, you know, well, you can pray to your deity God, and you can keep asking for miracles that will never happen. Lord, these are the people so desperately need to see, you know, you. That need to hear from you. That need to, you need to display who you are. It's not just a prayer request for those who are amongst us here now, but Lord, for this community, for our county, for our province, for our country, and for those around the world. Lord, that you have already provided that way. You have already provided the path. Bring belief to those unbelieving. Bring healing to those who are ill. And Lord, bring your spirit to those who are desperately seeking you and even those who don't know it. They know there's something missing, something that should be there, and they just don't know what it is. Lord, provide your spirit for them and even for us as well. They know there's times even in my unbelief I struggle with things. So, Lord, I'm so grateful that we live in a community that we can freely worship you. And, Lord, we bring these people before you week after week, but it's daily. And we do it with expectation. And I have seen your work. I have seen the miracles. And there are many here that will say the same thing. And we know that you're more than just real. You are Lord and Savior. So, Lord, as the ushers come forward as well, I would ask that you would collect this offering, that it may be used in order to send more workers into the vineyard, for the harvest is great, and the workers are few. So, Lord, bless this offering. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Let's stand. Light's green. Uh, first of all, does everyone have a pencil and a small piece of paper? Anyone who doesn't? Okay. Good. You'll need that. I'm going to start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can come here today. We are grateful that your spirit is here with us. And Father, I am grateful for your spirit. Every minute of every day. And I know that I don't deserve um, the salvation that you bought for me. And I don't deserve the Holy Spirit, and I don't deserve to stand up here and uh, share your word. But I also know that this is uh, what you've called me to do, so I pray that uh, 
your spirit would be the one speaking today. That we would hear from you, not from me. I pray that you would prepare each heart, mine as well, to hear what you have to say. And bless us all, we, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think, I uh, just want to check something here, make sure I have the right notes. No. <laughs> yep, I think I'll be able to read today. My eye has, uh, had the, the blood in my eye has been draining, doing whatever they say, draining. I don't know, it, it, it floats to the bottom, or settles to the bottom, and then I guess the eye reabsorbs it, and eventually I can see again. So we're getting to the point where I'm, I, I, this eye is now about as good as this eye. This eye, <laughs> it's probably never going to be great, but... It, it, right now, if I do this, it looks like there's Vaseline smeared across the lens. So, but I can now see you. I can now see you. So praise the Lord for that. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get started here. All right. So, perfect. You have all seen one of these. You know what they are. In fact. You know, you know that there's one coming for you, right? There's a day in which, you know, that's, all right. Also, thank you to the people that, um, that bought this thing, because now I don't have to worry about smacking microphones. <laughs> we, we all know that this is coming, don't we? It's come for, it comes for everyone. I, I did a little, little searching on the internet, and I noticed, I found some of these. These are, these are funny, but they actually exist somewhere in North America. This one is maybe one of the most famous. Here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. <laughs> Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. Y you have to wonder about the people writing these. Here lies a man named Zeke, second fastest gun in Cripple Creek. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this one's sad. Bill Blake was hanged by mistake. That, that's pretty sad. This is one June would love. On the 22nd of June, Jonathan Fiddle went out of tune. told you I was sick. <laughs> and I was hoping for a pyramid. <laughs> now, you know, you, you, you have to think that the people who wrote these, um, <laughs> maybe they weren't too close to the people they wrote them for, right? Because you would, <laughs> you would hope that they would come up with something better than that. but we're all going to have something written on our tombstone, aren't we? And the question is, what is that going to be? So what I want you to do with your piece of paper and pencil is I want you to write on there, don't start yet, because I want to set some parameters. First of all, I want you not to do this from the perspective of your loved ones, okay, the people that, that love you, because you know the people that love you are going to put something nice on there, aren't they? Unless, unless, unless perhaps the, the wrong relative gets the job. But I want you to do this from the perspective of the people of the world around you, the people you work with, the people that you meet in the grocery store, the people on your street. I want you to do this from their perspective, and I want you to write on this piece of paper what, what you would like your epitaph to say. What would, you, what would you like them to write on your epitaph? So I'm going to give you a few minutes, a few minutes, well, it won't take that long, will it? But give you, give you 30 seconds or so to, to, to contemplate what would you want the world to say about you when you've passed.
And now, I would like you to turn your paper over and write down what you expect they would say now, based on who you are now, based on what they see now. What do you expect they're going to put on your epitaph? Question, are they the same? Are they the same thing? I know mine isn't. I think every one of us would like the world to say, we're a winner, right? We'd like them to say good things. We'd like them to say, perhaps, that they saw Jesus Christ in us or that we were loving. And I expect most of us expect to see something different. I expect most of us expect to see that we didn't live up to what we wanted to live up to. So the question then is, how do we change the trajectory of our lives so that in the end, we end up with a, with, a, with a gravestone, a tombstone that says what we want it to say, what we hope it would say. How do we change the trajectory of our lives so that people are going to see Christ in us? I intend today to tell you how to do that. Not in some nebulous, uncertain terms, but in a very practical way, how you can walk out of here and the trajectory of your life after you walk out of here today will change. And we're going to do that by looking at John. 1 John 5, verses 1 to 12. Now, I don't know about the other people that have been preaching through this, but I'm finding that I got the best scriptures. I'm sorry, Ann, Eddie... And, and I agree, I think, I think it's, it's as, you, 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 as we're doing this, we're reading over the whole book, but we're really digging into the, ones, the pieces that we've gotten to preach, and you just got to love it. Now, the thing, like, the thing about John, okay, let's, let's look at Paul. Paul, Paul was very, he's kind of like me, he's very, now I'm not saying that I'm exceptionally intelligent, I mean not out loud. But Paul's a little bit, I'm a little bit like Paul. Paul is very, deductive, right? A plus B equals C plus D equals E plus F equals G. And he goes through and just ding, 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 puts it all down in line and you have to, you can follow it and you have to get there. Not everybody thinks like that, do they? There are some of us that when you talk to them, there are some people when I talk to them, I want to make a point. I have something I want them to get. And that's communication, right? Communication hasn't happened until they understand what I'm trying to say. And so I, 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 as a good communicator, I look for signs that they're getting what I'm saying. And there are some people that I talk to that I will, I will get I, A plus B equals C. And they will take C and go somewhere else. And it brings something to, mind, to their mind, and they'll, they'll jump on that, and they'll go there, and I'll go, okay, did he get, did he get C? Or, or where's he going with this? And so I, I, I find myself repeating, okay, well, no, that is really good, but A plus B equals C, right? I'm like Paul. John, I don't, James is nothing like Paul. Have you read the book of James? 
James is everywhere, right? One minute he's talking about the tongue, then he's talking about, 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 about loving people, and then he's, and, and I read James and I go, okay, but what is your point? Like, what are you actually trying to say here? A, James, James is A plus A, Z, F, L. John is a fisherman. And as I read through John, and, and, and you've all noticed it, I think, things come up again and again and again. Love. Love your brother. Love God. Love your brother. Right? Light. Um, these things come up again and again. But if you, if you actually dig into it and study it, they come up again and again, but they're a little different next time. He adds a little bit to it next time. It's like, it's like the rolling waves. Right? Like a understand the, the rolling waves. And it's kind of like that. So we're going to go over some of the same things that we've already gone over, but they're a little bit different, and I'm going to hit them a little different because we're in a different place. So we're going to start here in verse 1, because that's where you start. Hmm. And verse 1 says this, Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father... Loves the child born of him. Now we've heard, but we've heard, have, this is not new, right? If you love God, you love his children. But this twisted it for me a little bit. Because if you love God, you love those who are born of God. So all of a sudden there's a reason to love them. It, it just somehow something clicked. And it clicked to me when I, when I, I realized that I have, we have friends, Gerda and I. I, I, I understand it's hard to believe. For me, not for her. <laughs> we have friends that we've known, oh, 30, 30 years. We've gone camping for, week, week, for weeks together. We've done all, all this stuff together. Now, they have four children. We have four children. And their children sometimes can get on my nerves. There's a story there, Mel will remember, from... <laughs> They can sometimes get on my nerves, but you know what? We got to go to one of their we to one of a wedding. One of their weddings? That must be it. We got to go one of their to one of their weddings the past couple years, and it was fantastic. I loved it, and I love her. I love their kids, and I don't love their kids because they are necessarily lovable. Now, don't get me wrong; they're great kids. They're great people adults now, and, and, but I love them because I love their parents. We have some people that we went to, to Briarcrest with out west. We, were in, we, we, we ended up in, motel, in the motel rooms. We were supposed to have a place to stay in a building. We got there. Sorry, that's not that available, but we do have a hotel room for you. And we, we packed everything we had, went out there and got to move it into a two-room two, you know, two hotel room. But right beside us were this, was, was this couple, Wes and Darcy. And we got to know Wes and Darcy, and we got to love Wes and Darcy. And all the, all, all the Bible college married, married student kid, you know, stuff doing without because you don't have anything, all of that stuff we dealt with together. And it was fantastic. And they have three kids. We met one of them before we came here when she was tiny. Now they have three kids, and I would love to meet those kids. I love to meet those kids because I know that they're great people because I love their parents. Have you ever gone out of the province or to some place where you're uncomfortable because it's not your home and maybe something's happened to your car and you end up at a garage and someone gives you a hand and somehow in the conversation you find out that they're Christians? And right there, there's, there's that bond. And you drive away thinking this has happened, and you drive away thinking, I wish I could get to know them better. It's because we love God that we love his children. And we want to see the best for them, and we want to help them when they're hurting. I don't know, but that, that, that resonates with me. And then he can, the wave continues to roll. And he says, 
By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, we observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, what commandments? We've heard this already, I don't know how many times. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments. And we talked about this a little before, but I, wanna, I, I, I just felt that I really want to hit this, that this is something that we need to talk about. What commandments? When I was a child, grew up in a, 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 a Christian Reformed family, Dutch family. When I was a child, we were not allowed to play cards. I mean, we could play, nowadays we'd be able to play Uno because they weren't with the regular pack of playing cards. But we were not allowed to play with a regular pack of playing cards. On Sundays, we would, Ray, Ray would love this, he, at home he will love this. On Sundays, we would drive to church and we'd drive by somebody and one of the, lawn, one of the neighbors would be mowing the lawn and my father would be, up Sunday? That's, you don't do that on a Sunday. There were certain commandments that we had to keep. We went to church twice on a Sunday because that's what Sundays were for. And you didn't not go to church unless you were pretty ill because that's what Sundays were for. And yet, well, when we were at church, after the service, we could go out and have a cigarette with the pastor. So there are all kinds of commandments. I'm sure that some of you have different commandments that you could, did or didn't keep on a Sunday or any other time of the week. When we were at Briarcrest, as married students, we could go see movies. But the single students couldn't because their parents might not have wanted them to. So everybody lived under the same commandments. So when John says that if we love him, we will keep his commandments, what commandments? Well, let's go back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament, there are, I believe, 640 commandments that the, that the Israelites had to keep. Um, you could not boil a kid in its mother's milk. You could not wear clothing that had two mixes of material. Now, I guarantee you that there's probably not even, guarantee probably. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 there's, a <laughs> there's a very good chance that there's not one of us in this building right now that doesn't have at least one article of, article of clothing on that is a mixture of, of, of materials. Cotton, rayon, polyester, whatever. Why? Why don't we keep these 640 commandments? Well, okay. That was for them, not for us. There, there, there was a time and a place, like no, not eating pork. We can now eat pork because, well, for one reason, we can cook it, perhaps, or we know enough to cook it better than they do. I don't know. I'm not really sure what the reason was they weren't supposed to eat pork. Maybe it was just don't eat it because I need to set some stuff apart. I don't know. I did not dig into that for this sermon. You can do that yourselves. But let's, let's, let's do, obviously those are not commandments that we all feel obligated to keep. But the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments, that's got to be the ones. Because those were written by God's finger on pieces of stone and put in the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and stayed there forever. Wherever the Ark of Co the Covenant is now, they're probably still in it. I've heard that it could be underneath Golgotha, although I'm kind of skeptical. You, you never know what you find on, on, on the internet nowadays. But those 10, those are the commandments he's talking about, right? But let's fast forward a few thousand years. Paul and Barnabas come back from their first... Um, I think I got that in the wrong order. Nope. 
Okay. They come back from their first missionary journey, and they want to make sure they're not throwing stuff out there that they shouldn't be because they've had people come and say, hey, if these people want to, obey the, want to become Christians, they have to be circumcised. They have to obey the right commandments. Right? They have to obey the commandments. So they, 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 they meet in Jerusalem. They have a big powwow. Oh, maybe I'm not allowed to say that anymore. They have a big meeting. And James... The guy who seems to be in charge says this, Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write, them, write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. Now, these are Gentiles that they're talking about. And the Gentiles, how many of you think the Gentiles knew the Ten Commandments? Yeah, I don't think they did either. But there's nothing in here about tell them to keep the Ten Commandments and don't eat stuff given to idols and, and whatever. There's nothing in there about that, is there? Why? If, if we ask about these ones, let's ask about these. Why did they pick these particular th commandments to give to the to the, the uh, Gentiles. The next verse says, For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach them, him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So what was the point? The point was, if the Jews see you Gentiles eating meat that is given to idols, they're not going to, they're go they're not going to accept Christianity. Because they're going to think that Christianity has nothing to do with the Jews. So there was a reason for these commandments that they gave them. There was a point, and the point was we want Jews to come to Jesus as well. So we, want to, we don't want to do anything that is going to stop Jews from coming to Jesus. So when we, as we send missionaries around the world, there are probably times when we say to them, don't do this, this, and this. If we're going to send missionaries into a Muslim country, there are things we're going to t say to them, it's not wise to do these things because if you do these things, they are not going to come to Christ. So let's look at these commandments. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. Therefore, concerning the things, the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there is our so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God. Then he skipped, we skip down to verse 9. But take care that this liberty, what liberty? The liberty to eat things given to idols. Be, take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge, the knowledge that eating things given to idols is not a, bat, is not a sin. If someone who see, sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? And if he does, will he not see, f feel its sin and end up condemning himself, which is not what we're supposed to do? And it goes on through here, throughout that verse, and also Romans 8, it talks about giving up things because I, you have a weaker brother. Right? Do, do I really need to eat food do, do, given to idols. I don't need to. I don't feel it's a, it's, it's a problem, but I don't need to because my brother feels it's a problem. So then I abstain from it for him. So that's what he's talking about. But what we see is even those commandments that they gave in the first century didn't stay, didn't hold out forever, did they? So in John 5, 1 to 3, what commandments? What commandments are we as Christians supposed to follow? If all of this stuff somehow, in some cases, we've had mission organizations that went to places in Africa and 
had a horrible time trying to find elders for the churches they started because every, every man in the, in the village had more than one wife. And what does Paul say? An elder must be the husband of one wife. And, the, and, and, and in the past, we struggled over that, and I, I would probably say, you know what, find men Tell everyone who's going to be married now that we don't marry more than one wife, but maybe we choose elders, people to be elders who have more than one wife because it's not, that was, is that commandment meant for every place? If there are times when we can't do that, do we find ways around it? Because what commandments is John talking about? Well, let's back up to John 3.23. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. In Matthew 22, 35 to 40, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The Ten Commandments are right there. So do we have to tell people, do we have to preach the Ten Commandments to the Gentiles? No, because the Ten Commandments are right here. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love your neighbor. So when, Jesus, when John says, his commandments are not burdensome, why are they not burdensome? Is it hard to love your brother? He's told us over and over and over and over again that we need to love our brother, so is that so hard to do? It shouldn't be. If we truly love them, it shouldn't be hard to, when we see they, they're in need of something, as he says earlier in the book, we give it to them because we have it and they don't. Or as James says, when someone comes to you and they're hungry and they're thirsty and they're cold and you say, been a great, t- had great talking to you, um, hope you, hope you get something to eat. That's not love. So all of the commandments are bound up right here. That even the Ten Commandments are bound up right here. Love God and love your neighbor. And everything else that we choose to pull in, that we choose to, to, to live by, play, not playing with cards, not smoking, not cutting the lawn on a Sunday, every one of those things is meaningless to loving my brother. Unless... My brother doesn't play cards and thinks it's illegal to play cards, right? That's the love. And love is not burdensome. What do the Muslims have to do? Do they have to kneel five times a day and pray towards Mecca? And these, those things are burdensome. I mean, they would be for me. But we don't, God, none of our commandments are burdensome, he says. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So how do we overcome the world? Do we overcome the world by putting up certain commandments, right? Certain things we should and shouldn't do, and that will help us overcome the world? Is that how it's done? John says it's our faith. Not, our, not these commandments that we like to put in place. Who is the one who overcomes the world, but the, we're going to come back here. Who is the one who overcomes the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That's our faith, right? Now, we're going to come back here because this is, this is where I want to kind of dig my, uh, I don't know, where I want to concentrate. But let's, let's move on for now. John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace in the world. It's peace. Okay, punctuation is still hard. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So 
<laughs> faith in Jesus overcomes the world because he has overcome the world. He's already done the work for us, hasn't he? When he died on the cross, he did the work for us. So overcoming the world shouldn't be that hard, should it? First John, back to the John. This is the one who came by water and the blood. Who is? Jesus Christ. Not though with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. There is the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three are in agreement. So what does that mean? Well, he's back again as he has been before, talking about Jesus as the Son of God. Come in the flesh as Son of God. And if you do not believe that he came in the flesh, you do not believe that he is the Son of God. So he's, this, he's back on this same thing again. The water, at his baptism, the Holy Spirit came down upon him. And God said, this is my beloved Son, right? The water testifies that he is the Son of God. Because God's voice said that. The blood, well, you know what the blood is, right? He shed his blood. He died on the cross for our sins. He, 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 he rose again. And we saw him and we touched him. The water and the blood testified that this was Jesus Christ because there is no one else who's risen from the dead besides Jesus Christ. And the Spirit testifies, doesn't he? So if we... I want to go here. I think I want to go to the next slide. Nope. Nope. Back up. There we are. That's the one I want. The Spirit, Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So there's the testimony, right? The Spirit testifies. So there's the water, Jesus' baptism, and the Holy Spirit. The blood, Jesus' death and resurrection, and the Holy Spirit testifying in our hearts that he is the Son of God. Now I want to go to the slide with uh, John 5, 9 to 10a. I must have missed him up. Anyway, if we receive the testimony of men, and we do, don't we? In every court in the land, we receive the testimony of men. The testimony of God is greater, for the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son in three ways. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself, and, and, then, and then we'll just skip to the, where that carries on. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. And because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son does not have the life. So, Jesus is the key, isn't he? To everything. If you have the Son, you have the life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the life. Irregardless of the commandments you have broken. Because he died for those commandments on the cross. But I told you I was going to tell you how how to change the trajectory of your life. And we're going to go back now to verses 5, no, verses 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That seems like a, a worthy, worthy thing to do, right? Overcome the world. Because the world is, what did he say in John, 20, John 2? 15 to 17. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, 
and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of the God lives forever. So what is the world? The lust of the flesh. What is that? Well, what is the flesh? This is flesh, right? That's true. But the flesh, biblically, is everything, all of, our, all of everything that, that, that comes out of us being human. The flesh would have been great if Adam and Eve had not fallen, but they did fall. So now everything that comes from the flesh is all of those things, the lust of the flesh is, is a craving for all of those things that the flesh craves. Now, we could, we, could, we could simplistically mark it down to food, right? We all want to eat. We lust after food. We lust after too much food. That's bad for you. We could, we could mark it down to those things, but I think the lust of the flesh goes deeper than that. I think it is those things that cause us to, 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 to crave the food. It's things like the need to be loved. It's not a bad thing until it becomes a lust. The need to be significant. Again, not a bad thing until it becomes a lust. Met in Jesus, there's no problem. But not met in Jesus, the need for peace becomes a problem because where do we seek it? Some of us seek it in drugs. Some of us seek it in alcohol. And some of us seek these things to such an extent that they end up living on the streets of St. Thomas and Woodstock and Aylmer because they are seeking the lusts of the flesh. What are the lusts of the eyes? Well, we can, we're, 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 we're naturally going to jump to the lust of the eyes is pornography. True. But it's more than that. The lust of the eyes is when we see something and we want it. That's the lust of the eyes. When I see that my neighbor has a nicer car than mine and I want a car like that, but I don't have a job that my neighbor has, so what do I do? I find a way. I put myself way, way too far in debt. The lust of the eyes is anything we see that we want to have. And the boastful, boastful pride of life <laughs> <laughs> is Elvis Presley standing up and singing, I did it my way, right? It's Nebuchadnezzar when he walks around the, 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 the wall of his city and he says, look at this kingdom that I made. Anytime we take the credit for stuff that is not our to take, that's the boastful pride of life. Jesus is the answer to the boastful pride of life. Because we, we recognize that Jesus gave us everything we have. Jesus is the answer to the lust of the eyes because we recognize that Jesus Christ may not have called us down that road. Is that car really that important? Are any of these things really that important? So, how do we overcome the world? Well, what did John say? Our faith. We can't overcome the world with our faith. When these things come into our face, when we see something that we want, we turn to Jesus instead because Jesus has given us everything we need. When we see, when we desire something like peace, or contentment, or love, or significance. We turn to Jesus, because Jesus can give us all of that, right? <laughs> Only it doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work. And that's a problem. And I know you're looking at me and you're saying, it doesn't work. The Bible says right here it works. 
But look at us, Christians. Every study that they've put out there shows us that we are no different from the world. The world turns to pornography. So do we. It doesn't work. Our divorce rate is no lower than the world's. It doesn't work. By every metric, we are exactly the same as the world. So now tell me that faith in Jesus Christ makes any difference at all. Why are we here? Why is this the case? Why are we exactly the same as the world? And this is the point. We are exactly the same as the world because we are starving ourselves. We have faith in Jesus Christ, absolutely. And when the, when the lusts come upon us, we turn to him all the time. But if you're going to be a winner, if you're really going to be a winner, if you're going to go to the Olympics and win something at the Olympics, what do you have to do? You see, we Christians, the vast majority of us, come to church to be fed, don't we? We say that all the time. We want a pastor who's going to feed us. We want a church that's going to feed us. Those of us that are doing really well, pick up our Bibles and read a chapter or two before bed. The daily bread, we hand them out here. After, din after dinner, we pick up the Bible, read, read, read six or seven verses of some passage, and then this little blurb. And we think we're being fed. Let's put that in these terms. Let's, let's say that every Sunday, we got together and had a potluck. We sat down together as, as, as a church and we had a potluck every Sunday. Every other day, after dinner, we had a snack. Before bed, we had a sandwich. And let's pretend that that's all we ever ate. Do you expect to win a marathon on a diet like that? Do you expect to win anything on a diet like that? Do you want to change the trajectory of your life? Do you want to end up a winner? Start eating. It's that simple. It's that simple. Do you want to be able to stand up against the temptations when they come flooding into you? Start eating. If you start eating, you will be able to overcome. It's not Jesus that's the problem. It's not our faith that's the problem. The problem is we're starving ourselves. Do you want to overcome? Stop starving yourself. And I guarantee you, this is an ironclad guarantee. If you stop starving yourself, you will win. Every time, you will end up a winner. We cannot live this life 
without eating. So I'm going to challenge you today. It's not a hard thing to do. I'm going to challenge you today to read your Bible for a half hour every day. A half hour. Now, I know the thoughts that come to mind, where am I going to find a half hour? How can I read my Bible? And you know what? Those, those thoughts are Satan jumping right up in your face and saying, this can't be done, dude. You don't have the time. You've got lots of time to flip through your phone. You've got lots of time to watch television. But you'll never find the time to read your Bible, will you? He's lied to us over and over and over again because he knows that the, the only way we're going to win is if we start eating. Now, this doesn't have to become a commandment, okay? I don't have to turn to you and say, hey, Melanie, you better eat tomorrow. Do I? It's what, <laughs> if you want to live, that's what you do. So if you want to live, start eating. A half hour a day. Put away one sitcom. It's not that hard to do. You know how I know? I did it. I did it. I spent my life starving myself. And I would sit down, and I would read one, one chapter or two chapters at night, and I, oh, I had a journal, so I was doing okay because I was journaling. I said, what did I learn from this? Da, 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 da. That's not eating. Take your Bible for a half hour, sit down with your Bible, and just read it. Just read it. And you will eventually get a love for it. Just read it. It's, this is my time. This is your time to sit down with Jesus Christ, to sit down with God your Father, and just spend some time with him. And I guarantee you, it will change your life. I guarantee it. It has to. Because it's your food. So, half hour a day. You miss a day, it's not a big deal. I missed a day. I started about this time last year, started reading my Bible for a half hour a day. The only thing, I, the only reason I did it was I said, you know what, I just want to be with God. I just want to spend some time with God. I missed a day. And that irked me. I did not like that. Now, I'm, uh, <laughs> I made up for it because that's the kind of guy I am. You don't have to. If you miss a day, you miss a day, right? Then you pick it up the next day. I made up for it. I spent, the, I, we, we went to Aruba, and while I was in Aruba, I read the, I read the Bible for 35 minutes a day <laughs> for two weeks. So I made up for my day lost. But whatever, this is not a commandment. This is a chance for you to allow God to work in you. And to do that, you have to eat. Now, I say it's a guarantee. I want to uh, put, that, put that video up now. I want you to watch this.
that you will never get if you don't read it. Now, he says, it, he says at, 40, at four days a week is where things change. So I guarantee you at seven days a week, you are a winner. We thank you that you've given us everything we need. I pray that um, you know what? I forgot something, something very important. I gave you. A, I, I, I want to give you this challenge to make a commitment today to read your Bible, to feed yourselves. So, what I would like to do is you all have a pencil and a piece of paper. If you would like to make this commitment that from this day forward I'm going to read my Bible for half an hour a day, wherever that takes me, and I'm going to ask you to come forward while we're singing our final hymn and throw your pencil and piece of paper in this basket. If you don't need to make that commitment because you're already reading your Bible, you're already feeding yourself, then on your way out, put your pencil and paper in that little basket on the way out. That'll make it easier for us to pick things up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are God and you are a good God. You're our Father and you love us, and you want to spend time with us. We find it easier, I think, to pray than to read, to spend time with you. <laughs> and I suspect we don't find a lot of time for that either. But Father, help us to start here. Help us to start eating to start feeding ourselves your word so that in the times when trials come upon us, in the times when the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the prideful, boastful pride of life comes upon us, Father, we have the strength to stand by faith in Jesus Christ who is everything we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.
greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory 